uh, be here in the Missions Conference. Pastor Green's allowed me to preach each night at the conference, and that's a blessing. But my wife, let me introduce my wife, honey, won't you stand? It's my life, Joy. I'm one of those blessed men that have joy everywhere I go. <laughs> and, uh, as you can see, my wife is a native of the country of South Korea. Uh, I'm U.S. Army, retired, active duty in the Lord's Army. Uh, yeah. Retired from the Army, spent 21 years in the Army, U.S. Army bomb disposal. Uh, we had a safe job. <laughs> One step that we're going to the banks and safe the explosives so you can continue putting money in there. And uh, God called me to preach out of Madison, Alabama, Madison Baptist Church, Madison, Alabama. Our pastor's Dr. Mike Allison down there. Some of you may have heard him or may not. That doesn't matter, does it? Uh, praise God. Well, what does matter is that I was born again. I was to serve him and given me the privilege of doing that in South Korea where we minister predominantly our ministries to the United States military. Uh, I, I tell folks I spent 23 years on deputation. Uh, <laughs> our retired military retirement makes up about uh, almost half of our support in Korea. And uh, so I, I spent 21 years in the Army learning the language as well. So I do know the language of the U.S. military. <laughs> and, uh, most of, that's our mission field, the United States military. We have, said, God bless, we've had 54 different people in our church. Been in Korea for 14 years as a missionary. And we've had 54 different nations represented in our church. People from nine different nations born again. Uh, people from Amen. nine different nations Amen. baptized, Amen. and people from five different nations have surrendered for ministry and are Amen. ministering on different areas Amen. of the field and different areas Amen. of the world. So God has been, he's been more than good to us, uh, and we praise the Lord for all that he's done and all that he's going to continue to do. Just before leaving Korea in March on our furlough, uh, resigned the church where I've been the pastor for 14 years. And uh, when we return to Korea in March of this coming year, we'll be moving south and planning a new church. Uh, outside of Osan Air Force Base, just a further, about, a, about an hour and a half south of where we've been for the last 14 years. Um, the reason for the move is our government is, great wisdom has taken place. Um, when, uh, when Rumsfeld was the SECDEF, he was in Korea and made the determination that we didn't need to be so close to North Korea. Uh, our headquarters where we've been ministering is in Seoul, it's 25 miles from North Korea. They, we know that there are 600 artillery pieces aimed at Seoul, Korea, and so our headquarters would vanish uh, when North Korea decided to come. It would just turn into a dust cloud. So they're moving all of our military further south, so we're going with them. And so we resigned the church and the missionaries taking over that work, transitioning it into a Korean ministry, and we'll go south and plant a new church outside of Osan Air Force Base. So we'll continue to reach the U.S. military. And now God's given us an opportunity to reach the Korean military as well. Yeah, so we're excited about the new possibilities. Ask you to pick up one of our prayer cards out there and pray for us as uh, we continue our furlough and get ready to go back. Amen. I'm pleased to have the honor of preaching to you this morning. The two of the hardest groups for me to preach to are children and pastors. <laughs> I can preach to soldiers and I can preach to prisoners. Uh, those don't bother me. Children scare me to death. And preachers, what do you preach to a preacher? Uh, preachers preach every day. Uh, that's their life. What do you <laughs> preach to a preacher? Well, so I pray that the message that I've got for you this morning will be an encouragement Amen. and be a help to you and your ministry. I know if you're like me, uh, there's struggles in your life. Mm -hmm. And there's times when you just want to throw in the towel and say, enough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I believe it's, it's, it's easy to get discouraged in the day and age in which we live. Mm -hmm. And I pray this will be an encouragement and a blessing to you. Open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23, and look with me in verse 8, 2 Samuel 23 and verse 8. I'll be as brief as I can this morning. I'm not known for being brief, but I'll, I'll give that a shot. 2 Samuel chapter 23, beginning in verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Teclanite, that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, he is an idol. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men of David, when they defied the Philistines that were there, gathered together into battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave to the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. After him was Shem, the son of Aji, the Herorite, and the Philistines gathered together in the troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought 
a great victory. I want to preach on staying in the bean field. Staying in the bean field. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. And God, we are thankful that you've given us this opportunity to join together to fellowship. And Father, be under the preaching and teaching of your word. Pray, God, now your power would be upon me this day. Fill me with your spirit and use me this morning to be a help. To be an encouragement. And Father, to exalt our Savior and to honor and glorify Him in all that I do. And I ask and pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can see 2 Samuel 23. It tells us of David's mighty men. Now, this was a great group of warriors. I love soldier stories. I was one for a long time. And I still, I minister to soldiers and I'm a soldier of the cross, so I love soldier stories. Amen. And this book, as we read in 2 Samuel chapter 23, is a story about soldiers. These are great men. Great warriors that stood with David on the battlefield, helped him to win the many victories that he ran, that he won. And we see three very special men in this passage. Men that were personal bodyguards to the day to David. And who who could you have better as a bodyguard than men like those three? I mean, men that fought where the normal man would not be able to stand anymore. They fought. And and against incredible odds and done some great and mighty things. But I want to focus on one of those three men for just a few minutes this morning. I want us to look at that man, Shema. He's described for us as a man that took, he took a stand against overwhelming odds in, in a field of lentils, or a bean field, if you will, a pea pat, some call it. Um, doesn't matter what you call it. It was a field that belonged to God's people. It was God's ground. And he stood in the middle of it, and he fought against an enemy that, by any rights, should have won. We look at it from a physical standpoint, they should have won. He was a man, I think, that you and I can learn much from this morning. The Bible tells us the Philistines attacked the people of God. And when they came, everybody ran. Except this guy. He stood his ground. He stayed in one place. Um, he was a one-man army. He was one man that decided he was going to stay no matter what everybody else was doing. He was a one man that stood against an overwhelming force. And you see in the passage, he got a victory. He got a victory. There's three things I want us to see from this story. Um, but I, one of the things I want us to get is there's a time to stand and fight. Right. Um, there's a time to stand and fight, and there are things to stand and fight for. Amen. In the day and age in which we live, I know it's tough to stand and fight, but it hasn't changed. There are things to fight for. Yeah. There are things that are important, and things that we need to stand up and we need to fight for. Some of the things that we're going to see here. One, this was a time of great conflict. You look at verse 11. And after him was Shema, the son of Ajah, the Herodite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. And there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. It's clear in the Bible this was a time of great conflict for the children of Israel. I mean, as you read through the, the Old Testament, you find the children of Israel always in a time of great conflict. And, and it really hasn't changed, has it? They're still in a time of great conflict where they are today. Mm -hmm. um, but we see God's people under attack here. Yeah. And I want you to, to see that there's three things we need to see about this time, about this place. One, we see when the enemy attacked. It said that the people were in the fields when they were attacked. Um, it leads me to believe this was a time of harvest. Right. You know, the only time you're in the fields, really, you plant, and then you go back and you pick. I'm sure there's other times when you've got to do work things. But when you plant, there's, there's nothing to attack the field for. Uh, there's, there's nothing there yet. So there must have been crops in these fields. And the people were working these fields when they were attacked by the enemy. Uh, they were working the harvest. And I, I think that's a good lesson for you and I. How many times do you and I as, as preachers and as other folks find ourselves busy, even doing good things, doing right things, when we're attacked by the enemy? Uh, I mean, even sitting in your office studying, you be attacked by the enemy. Uh, my wife and I, we realized this not long ago where we've been on furlough since March. And, you know, I'm, I'm not getting younger. I'm 55 now. And although when I started in the ministry, I was already getting older. I had retired from the military. But it seemed easier then. I was in good shape. Just got out of the military. Now I'm 55, getting older, getting slower, getting broken. And we find that the road miles get longer. They get longer. As you travel, it just gets longer. And we found ourselves complaining. And we were complaining about, oh, we, we got to go to this church, and we got to go to that church, and we got to drive here, and, we, and we're staying in this hotel, and we're staying in this place, and staying in that place. And it's, it's not home. I don't have my pillow, and, and I don't have my blankie, and I don't, you know, all the things that we start thinking about that 
we were more comfortable when we were in our own place. And then we realized, we're under attack here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is not right. We're serving the Lord. Amen. Even on the furlough, as we drive from church to church and we stop to eat in Cracker Barrel. Uh, and we leave gospel tracts with our tip in there. And this whole service to the Lord, why are we complaining? Uh, we were under attack. So even when we find ourselves doing the right things, even when we find ourselves busy about good, busy about serving the Lord, you can come under attack. But oftentimes we don't even recognize it, that we're under attack. Simple things like murmuring and complaining in the work of the Lord. That's, a, that's an attack from the devil. He's just, God, I got him. He's excited yeah, about that. And right. it robs God from the glory that is, He is so deserving of. Amen. When we start with that kind of an attitude, and it took us driving down the road, and we were talking, and then we both realized, we're under attack here. That's right. yeah. this, is, this, is, this is horrible. We should not have this attitude. And we decided right then and there, no more victories for the devil. Right. We're just going to rejoice as we drive down the road. And, Amen. and uh, I don't know if many of you know Pastor Tid over at Lighthouse Baptist Church, one of our supporting pastors. We got some music from his church. In fact, the song that they sang is one of the songs on one of their CDs. We put that in, and man, we just rejoice with, with the with great music. We think about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we get excited about the next church we're going to be in and how God's going to use us to maybe be a help to someone there or be an encouragement to the preacher in some way. And we rejoice. Amen. We're not going to give the devil the victory. I think sometimes we as, as Christians and we as churches are like the church over in Ephesians chapter 2. You know, they were, they were a good church. They were a busy church. They were busy about serving the Lord. I think they got so busy doing good, they didn't even recognize it when the enemy slipped in and right. stole their joy and right. uh, took away their love for the Lord. Right. That can happen to you and I. Yeah. I think sometimes we get to that place. Nehemiah tells us how to be ready. He tells us how to be ready. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. It says, And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought into work, and the other half of them held both spears and shields and bows and habitants. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They that built it on the wall, and they that bear the burdens with those that laid them. Every one, get this now, every one with one of his hands wrought into work, right. and with the other held a weapon. Amen. They were working and ready at the same yes. time. Right. You and I, we've got to remember, this is our only way. Amen. Amen. Uh, you look over to Ephesians chapter 6, he tells us all the armor we've got, all the protection. By the way, that's full frontal armor. Uh, there's nothing to protect you from the rear. You're not to be running from the fight. Right. Run it into it. Uh, all the armor that he's given us is full frontal armor. I know something about that being the bomb squad. The only offensive weapon we have is the sword of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's all we have. This is our offensive weapon. So these men, in Nehemiah's time, they were building and ready. Yes, sir. They had one hand on the sword and one hand in the work. That means they had one eye on what they were working on and one eye looking for the end. Right. We need to be the same way for this. Right. Because the devil, will, he'll attack you even in your office. Right. You're sitting there praying. I don't know about you, but I get down to pray and that seems like that's the worst time uh, of attack for me. I get down to pray and all of a sudden I start thinking about... Oh, and next week we got to be in this church, and we're going to be driving here, and all oh, the football games on tomorrow. And I mean, just everything under the sun starts flooding your mind when you're down to pray, and you got to remind yourself, I'm not down here to think about all of that. Right, I'm down here to get a hold of God. Amen. I need Him to do something in my life. Amen. I need Him to help me to do something for somebody else. Amen. And so we got to remember to put ourselves back on victory ground, Praise God. and get our mind off of all the other things, and let the Lord flood our soul. Amen. And Nehemiah tells us how to do that. We keep one hand in the Word and one hand on the sword. And we focus on both at the same time. That way the enemy doesn't have an opportunity to come in. Because he is going to. He's yes. going to use every opportunity that he can. So let us learn to watch while we work. Amen. And be ready so when the attack comes, we're ready for it. We see something else. We see why the enemy came. The enemy came for two reasons. To inflict casualties and to destroy the crops. Or steal the crops. Uh, they came for one of those two reasons. To ruin the crops and to inflict casualties. Same thing is true of our adversary the devil. Right. He comes for the same two reasons. Right. To inflict casualties and to destroy the crops. Mm -hmm. What are the casualties he wants to inflict? The workers. Mm -hmm. right. He wants to attack the workers so the work will stop. That's us. Yeah. We're the right. workers. We're the ones working the harvest field. So when the enemy attacks, he wants to stop us from doing the work. And he wants to do damage to the crops. What are our crops? The mission field. Amen. That's our field. 
the mission field. And many of you are pastors. Uh, even though you're pastors, you're still missionaries. Uh, I mean, we serve a mission field. God, wherever God's got you placed, that's your mission field. Amen. Outside the doors of your church, that's your mission field. Uh, ours just happens to be across the seas uh, where the U.S. military is located in Korea. But our, our field is the harvest field, uh, where lost people are. Well, the devil wants to do everything he can to keep those people lost. So he's going to keep them blind and hinder us from opening their eyes. Uh, that's what he wants to do. Same, same attack that he put on the people of Israel. Uh, he was attacking to destroy the crops and hurt the workers. Same thing for you and I. That's what he's doing today. I want to let you in on a secret. A uh, secret you may already know. The devil doesn't care about us preaching here this morning. Mm -hmm. right. He doesn't care about us singing those hymns. He doesn't care about us fellowshipping and, right. and eating those good cinnamon rolls. And <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't care about us being here in this place. Right. We're no threat to him here. Right. We're a threat when we take what we get here and we go out there. That's, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's when the attack is going to really right. come. Amen. When we take what we get here and we put it to use out there. Yeah. So that's when we need to be really ready. We need to realize that when we leave this place, we're out of the place of safety. We're out of the place of protection. We get out there in the world and we start knocking on doors and start giving out gospel tracts and talking to people on the streets. Um, there's where the attacks are going to come. Right. Yeah. And there's where he's going to try to get victory in our lives. Yeah. There's where we're, he's going to challenge us to say it's not worth it. That's where he's going to challenge us to say, that's enough, I'm going back to my office. That's where the real attacks are going to come, and we must be ready for that, because that is the most dangerous time. That's when we are a threat to him. He doesn't care about what goes on here. He cares about what we take from here and go out there and use. Yeah. So we've got to be careful here and more careful out there. Have our eyes open and ready for the work. We see what the enemy found. And this is scary. What the enemy found when they come running in was a people that ran. Was a people that fled from the scene. They left behind that which God had given them. And they were just going to let the enemy have it. They ran away. That's what they found. You know, God is working to reach the world with the gospel, and the devil is fighting him every step of the way. Right. He's, he's, work, he's trying to stop God's work from happening. And I'm afraid in too many places, he's winning. Yeah. He is stopping God's work from happening in many places. And it's not because God's not doing the work. It's because the people that God put there stop doing the work. Right. It's, it's not God's job to win people to Christ. Right. It's our job. Amen. It's not Amen. God's job to get into a place and start winning people and bringing them out to the house of God. It's not God's job. That's our job. Amen. But in too many places, that has stopped happening. The workers, have, they, they fled. Yeah. They fled the ground that God has given. Right. They left behind those things that God has given to them. And, and you see these people running, and it sounds so much like our churches today. Yeah. I mean, as a missionary, we go in a lot of churches. Uh, you know, for us, we have right around 38 supporting churches for my wife and I. We have a few more new meetings this year. Um, and every time we come back on furlough, we're kind of scared. What will we find this year? Mm -hmm. What changes will we find in churches this time? And I'll be honest with you, I'm a missionary that fires supporting churches. Uh, I know that sounds weird. I had a pastor in Mississippi thought I was nuts. He said, no, churches drop missionary. I said, well, sir, that may be true, but I'm a missionary that drops churches. Uh, we've had some of our churches that went Southern Baptist. We had one of our churches in Alabama. They were they were they were Faith Baptist Church. We went to the field. We came home, and they were the Church of the Living Water. What is that? And I just called the pastor and said, "You can give your support to somebody else. We don't need it anymore." Um, you know, I hear people say, well, the devil's had that money long enough. Yeah, but my name's got to be associated with that. Right? I don't want to represent that. I want to represent those that are doing the work of God. I want to represent those that are standing on thus saith the Lord. And so we, we do. And we're scared every time we come home. What are we going to find when we go into these churches? Praise God, we found many of them that are still standing true Amen. to the Word of God. Amen. But you go in, you know, and all of a sudden there's CCM music being played in the auditorium. It's like... Oh, they've lost it. Yeah. They've lost it. And you see the changes as they gradually move closer to the world. What's happened? Somebody left the doors open let the world come in. That's, right. uh, that's what's happening. Uh, they stopped standing their ground. They have fled. The enemy wanted to come in, they left. You know, and, and that's happening in homes with parents as well. The children, they see in the world what they want, and parents will say, ah, it's just easier to let them happen. The parents have fled. 
They ran when they should be standing their ground and fighting. Amen. Churches are doing the same thing. When they should be standing their ground and fighting, they're fleeing and allowing the world to come in and take that ground which belongs to God. Right. And so we're scared every time. Because that's what the devil wants. He wants the churches to leave their doors open so he can bring it by the land. Whatever the world has, he wants to bring it into the house of God. You know, and I don't know about you, I'm not about a huge crowd. I'm about a church. Amen. If God wants a huge crowd, He can bring a huge crowd. Right, we don't have to bend and bow to the world to get a crowd. Yes, uh, we just need to do things God's way and have a church. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, you drive down the road, there's these big massive edifices. They put church signs in front of it. I'm sorry. Um, if that was a church, praise God that God gave them that kind of ground and gave them that kind of ground. <laughs> but it's not a church. It's a, it's a meeting hall. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fellowship center. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not doing a work there. Uh, not like this book says they're supposed to be. Amen. Uh, they're doing things the way the world wants it done. And that's how they got the big crowd. <laughs> because that's what the world wants. We're, we're not supposed to be statistic takers and find out what the world wants. Uh, we have the book that tells us what God wants. Yeah. Yeah. We just need to go ahead and take this and do it His way. Amen. And continue Amen. moving forward and fighting for the ground that God has given to us. Amen. And I believe God will bless that. Glad that God will honor that. So what do they find? They find people that fled away. But they found something else. They found one guy that stood there. And you know, for the enemy, they had to stand back and say, who does he think he is? Everybody left, he's by himself. He can't, he can't do anything against us. Who do they think he is? I think Samuel, he just decided, I'm not leaving. They killed me, whatever, but I'm staying. I'm just going to stay right here. See, because it was not only a time of great conflict, it was a time of great courage. You see over in verse 12, it says, but he stood in the midst of the of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord won a great victory. We see Seamus resolve. He just made a determination. I'm staying. No. I don't care. I'm staying. There's more of them. They're better armed. They're better equipped. They're big. They're powerful. I don't care. I'm staying. Amen. Everybody else left. I don't think he cared about that. I don't think he looked around to see where everybody else was going or what everybody else was doing. He just decided, I'm staying. I don't care what they're doing. I'm Amen. staying. And that's the, that's the same decision that we need to make. I don't care where everybody else is going. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't care what kind of games they're playing. I don't care what everybody else is, is going to do. I'm staying. Amen. I'm going to stand the ground that God has given me. And I'm going to fight right here where I'm at. Amen. That's what Shane said. That was his resolve. That's what he decided to do. And I, I pray, I pray that we find some shameless in this crowd. I pray that you have some shameless in your church that are willing to stand by you and fight the same fight. But even if you have to stand alone, that shame did. He stood by himself and didn't worry about everybody else. He just did what God wanted to do. I see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he says, Thou, there endure, uh, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier, Jesus Christ. When it gets tough, stay. When it gets hard, stay. Yeah. When, when everything is coming against you, stay. Stand your ground. Amen. He says, no man of war can hang with himself in the affairs of this life. Th there's a problem. There's a problem. See, there's too many that want to do the work of the Lord, so they've got one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Uh, they're entangling themselves with the affairs of this life. They want to have all that the world has to offer, but they also want to be blessed by God. So they want to try to, to lean both ways. Right. But we can't do that. He says we can't be entangled with the world. You know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, the soldiers that were entangled with the enemy, they were traitors. Yeah. And, and traitors, well, they deserve to be shot. That they do. They deserve to be shot. They're traitors. And we have too many Christians that are entangling with the world. Yeah. Uh, they deserve to be shot. Now, obviously not physically. And we can't do that. Uh, <laughs> we can't do that. But that's what a traitor deserves. They deserve to be shot or hung. Um, so we're not supposed to be wrapped up with the world. We're supposed to be wrapped up with God. And do what God wants to do. And that's what they found. They found a man that was ready to do what God wanted to do. I mean, God had given these people this ground. You say it was just a bean field. Not to shame them. It was God's ground. Amen. It was God's ground. It was God's people. And he wouldn't give it up. He was going to stay and fight for it. Why? Why? Well, he knew a couple of reasons. One, if the enemy took the field, the people would go hungry. Right. And two, he knew that if the enemy took the field, the 
people would be enslaved. Right. Somebody had to defend that field. Somebody had to stay their ground and fight for it. See, Shaman knew something we need to get a hold of. There's some things worth fighting for. Amen. Amen. There's some things worth fighting for. And I'll tell you what, this book right here is one of them. Amen. It's Amen. under attack everywhere. In Korea, it's right. under attack. Yeah. All over the world, it's under attack. People want to go to this version and that version. You go to a right. so-called Christian bookstore. We had one in Alabama. It was the almost Baptist bookstore. Um, <laughs> they go in there, and it's like they went to Baskin Robbins. They had the 32 flavors, um, but it was all different Bibles. And you get a young Christian going there, and they say, I need to buy a Bible. And immediately the salesperson takes them, well, we've got this one here. We've got this HIV, NIV, and all these other <laughs> weird versions of, of the Bible. The NIV, that's the not inspired version. Um, and they have all these other books. They try to feed these new Christians, but they right. will not take them to the church. Right. Yeah. yeah. They will not take them to the Word of God. That's right. And this is what they need. This book's worth standing for. It's worth fighting yeah. for. Yeah. Well, the preaching of the Word of God is worth standing and fighting yeah. for. Uh, my pastor, not long ago, he preached a message called Sodom America. Uh, that when, when, when they finally approved it, our Supreme Court said it was okay for Sodomites to marry, he preached the message called Sodom America. You know, many places a man go to jail for that. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, preaching the word of God is worth fighting for. It's worth standing for. And if I got to do it from behind bars, well, John Bunyan did. Right. Uh, I can too. I can too. And so can yeah. you. We'll just start prison ministries all over the world. Um, but this book is worth fighting for. The preaching of this book is worth fighting for. Yeah. This, the house of God is worth fighting for. Yeah. Yeah. I, we saw a church, uh, I think it was somewhere in Indianapolis. It's a, it's a hair salon now. It was a church building. It's now a beauty shop. Mm. I thought. What happened? Yeah. What happened? Yeah. Somebody didn't fight for that place. Right. Somebody didn't do what God said do in that place. Now they cut hair. Yeah. I've seen others that were in libraries and bars. Yeah. You know, how can they go that far? Somebody didn't fight for it. Somebody didn't stand for the house of right. God. Our families are worth fighting for. Yeah. And I do. I got seven grandchildren, and I want all of them to grow up serving the Lord. Amen. I want all of them to give their lives to Jesus Christ, whether it's on a mission field or whatever. I want my grandchildren to grow up serving the Lord. Amen. Our families are worth fighting for. Our field, the mission field, is worth fighting for. Amen. It really is. Men and women, I, you know, I met our brother here who was in uh, Jamaica for 40 years. Is that what you said, sir? Yes. Yes. 40 years. That's, that's staying in the ground. Amen. Yeah. That's staying in the ground. That, that's, that's what we need. Our mission fields are worth fighting for. Amen. We, have, we have more missionaries coming home than are going. Yeah. That's got to stop. Right. That's got to stop. I, I don't know why that is, but it's got to stop. I, I, I've met missionaries that used to be in Korea and now they're doing something else in America. So, well, why aren't you still over there? There's 50 million people in that country. Right. There's a handful of Bible preaching churches. Yeah. In Seoul, South Korea, a city of 20 million people, there's two Korean independent Baptist churches. 20 million people. Missionaries are going home. They're not going back. Our mission field is worth fighting for. Amen. Amen. We're, we're the shamans that stand right. and do what God said do. Where are those that God called to do it and they're selling hardware or they're selling furniture? I know one guy, I personally know, he was a missionary and I was selling furniture. What happened? Yeah. What happened? Where are those that God has called? They should be standing their ground. Where are the moms and dads that are going to say, I'm fighting for my kids. The devil's Amen. not getting them. Amen. I'm turning off the television. Turn off the video games. I'm putting away all the garbage the world wants them to have. And I'm going to stand for my kids. Yes. I'm not buying them a cell phone. I'm not giving them a smartphone so they can walk around looking like an idiot falling in the fountains while they're texting. <laughs> I'm not doing that with my kids. I'm going to train them up right for the Lord Jesus Christ. Their Bible is going to be one they carry in another man's book. Amen. Yeah. I get so tired of going in and seeing everybody sitting in church looking at an iPad. I don't know if they're sending text messages, playing games, or what. Uh, I told our church in Korea, don't you bring that here. You bring a Bible. Man, right. People see you walking down the street with an iPad, you could be going to Starbucks. <laughs> People see you walking down the street with a Bible in your hand, they got a good idea where right. you are. Yeah. So let's keep a testimony about ourselves. That's right. Man. I tell our people, man, let's, let's use the book. Man. There's some things worth fighting for, some things worth standing for. Man. Then we see Seamus reward. And I'm going to end it right here. Shame is reward. Amen. Why did he get a reward? He stayed. Yeah. I, I don't believe Shame was really any different than any other man. I mean, I, I want to believe that, that Samson was about five foot two and weighed about ninety pounds. Uh, you see in movies that Samson looks like a great big burly muscle bound. Uh, I don't believe Sam, Samson looked like that. I believe Samson was about five foot two and weighed about ninety five pounds because God got the glory and not Samson. Amen. You know, if he was a great big man, everybody said, "Oh, Samson's a 
powerful guy, but none of God got the glory out of his life. I believe Samuel was the same. I believe he was just a regular man that decided, I'm going to let God use me. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stay my ground, and I'm going to let God use me. And guess what? God did. Amen. God did. Why did he get rewarded? He stayed. Amen. He stayed. He fought the fight that nobody else would fight. He stayed his ground, and he got a tremendous victory. But we need to remember, it wasn't a shame of doing the fighting. God was just using that man. It was Amen. God's battle. God won the victory. It wasn't a shame of He's not the one that gets the glory. He's not the one that gets the credit. But he is remembered for the one that stood. Right. Yeah. He's, he's remembered as one that stood his ground and stayed when everybody else ran. Everybody else, they were cowards. But not Shema. He overcame the fear and stayed. And he fought the fight that nobody else would fight. When they all ran, they were remembered as cowards. He's remembered as a man, as a man that stood. Amen. You know, I, 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 want, I like to look at, at gravestones. Someday, I'll probably be looking up at one, but uh, I'd rather get raptured so I can look down on them. But all of us are going to see a gravestone someday. It's going to be ours. You know, on there, it's got the date you were born, and the dash, and the date you died. You know what the important part of that is? The dash. Right, amen. Because that's your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is your dash going to represent? Mm -hmm. What are you going to remember? What are you going to be remembered as? You know, when, when, when they see the dash, they go, oh man, I remember that guy. He praised with fervency. There was fire in his bones. There was fire in his pulpit. Oh, I remember that preacher. Is that your dash? How will you remember? Shame's dash, his name is in the Bible. God put his name in the book as a champion for Christ. Isn't that the way we want to be remembered? Yeah. As champions for our Lord? Amen. This man took a stand when nobody else would. Why him? He decided, I want to be used. Amen. God used me. And God used him. A one man army. He stood against great odds. You know, and, and folks, I, this is what I believe about Shema. I believe that he was bruised. I believe that he was beat up. I believe he got wounded in that fight. But I also believe that he's the one who can say, I was there. Yeah. I saw what God did. Amen. I was there. Yeah. Just he got beat up and bruised, but he didn't run off. Mm -hmm. Those other people, they can't say anything about what happened in the fight. They won't love him. Mm -hmm. yeah. He can say, I was there. I saw what God did that day. Amen. Man, our God is something else. Amen. Yeah. Nobody else could say that. Yeah. I just want to leave you with this question this morning. Are you going to stay and read through? Are you going to stay and read through? Are you going to be, is your dash going to be a dash like Shane's? One that God remembers. When you stand before it, your, your name, well, it won't go in the Bible because it's already finished. Um, but you will stand before Jesus and just as good as your name being in the Bible is well done, how good and faithful servant God. Amen. From the Lord Jesus Christ. What's your dash going to be when the time comes?
10. As you're turning there, uh, we have been in Haiti since 1998. Uh, I have passed the uh, time I was a police officer for 16 years. Now we have passed that from uh, being a missionary. So uh, the Lord is truly blessed and uh, God has prepared our hearts. And you know, I've learned that uh, you can't, pre you can't uh, compare ministries and as pastors you can't compare churches. God has placed you in a specific area for a specific place and a specific purpose. That's right. And uh, Brother Lewis was right. We're in a battle today. Amen. We uh, we are in a culture war right. per se right now. And in John chapter ten, we read a little bit about the sheep and the shepherd. And I want to speak to you this morning. I hope it's an encouragement to you because I know the first message was a challenge to stand for what we believe in. We must Amen. do that. Uh, the, the hope for missionaries is churches. Right. Without local churches, the missionaries are not going to be able to stand on the field. Right. Right. Unless they get a job in most of the missionary uh, areas, they won't let you work in another uh, country. <laughs> so it's important that we do stand in our local churches, Amen. but we need to understand our responsibility, not only as pastors, but as, as congregations, Amen. as believers in Christ, we have a responsibility to serve the Lord. Amen. And uh, in John chapter 10, let's just read that, verses 1, beginning in verse 1, John chapter 10, Jesus speaking here, He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to destroy and to kill, and, uh, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, we certainly have a lot of them that seem like our churches today. But he that is a hireling are not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not. Seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling. And careth not for the sheep. I am the shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now jump down to verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. My, I and my Father are one. Now I want to read a, a section in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. 
The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Take the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a, a ready mind. Amen. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, I, would, I pray that you would encourage our hearts today. Especially, Lord, I pray for every pastor here today that is trying to feed their flock. And Lord, it's very clear that most of the congregation has no idea what the burdens are on the pastors. Our, our pastors carry burdens that other people have no idea, only you know. And Lord, I pray that we would be an encouragement this morning. I pray that we would stand our ground and stand for the truth of your word. And Father, I pray you encourage every pastor, every uh, congregation, every church represented here this morning, that we would realize that we are in a battle. And Lord, we must stand for your word. And Lord, no matter what comes upon us, no matter what trials we face, we don't face them alone. We face them with you. Now, Lord, be with us this morning. Help me as I preach this word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The discourse of the Good Shepherd continues the same setting as in chapter 9. Comparing people to a shepherd and a sheep is common in the Middle East. Uh, kings and priests call themselves shepherds and their subjects sheep. And we tend to do that today. The Bible, as we know, makes frequent use of this analogy. And many of the great men of the Old Testament were shepherds. For example, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. And as national leaders, Moses and David were both shepherds over Israel. And some of the most famous passages in the Bible speak of this. For example, in Psalms chapter 23. Psalms chapter 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Thou art with me, Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Another passage is in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 6. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, it says, uh, the, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake his parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Right. Mm -hmm. And when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Amen. The Bible mentions shepherd and shepherding over 200 times. The Hebrew word for shepherding is often translated feeding. And shepherds often lead sheep to water. Shepherds oftentimes protect the sheep from wild animals. Uh, often shepherds guard their flocks at night, whether in the open or in the sheepfolds. So they have a responsibility to guard. 
Shepherds count the sheep as they enter. Shepherds take care of the sheep, even carrying weak lambs in their arms. Right. And shepherds give sheep the essentials of life, such as food and water. Shepherds are an example to the sheep. And I want to speak to you concerning the shepherd and the sheep this morning. And pray that this is an encouragement to you and a challenge because we have a great responsibility. Especially as a pastor, you have a tremendous responsibility to the flock that God has called you to. And so, uh, first of all, I want to share the shepherd's responsibility. You know, the primary role of the preacher, of the shepherd, is to tend or care for, to feed, to nurture, and to encourage. The shepherd's responsibility is to protect his flock. The responsibility of the shepherd is to lead and teach and train or equip that sheep to be able to stand for what he believes. Mm -hmm. And we are to feed people God's Word. Amen. John 21, 17 says, He saith unto him the third time, and asked Simon this question, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, and knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Amen. If you love me, feed my sheep. Amen. Tremendous responsibility. Amen. Yeah. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Mm -hmm. We don't feed newborns meat. Right. We begin with the milk until they begin to mature and have the ability to chew the meat that we didn't give them. Right. Amen. So we need to feed people God's Word. Mm -hmm. But we also need to preach and teach the Word. The Bible is very clear. In 2 Timothy, it gives us a command, Preach the Word. Amen. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, it tells us, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Amen. We can't afford to dilute the Word of God. Amen. There's a lot of people diluting the Word of God. Amen. They're watering it down to satisfy people. Amen. We can't afford to dilute. God. We can't afford to distort God's Word. As Pastor Lewis, Brother Lewis said, this is our instruction book. This is our doctrine for faith and practice. If we throw this away, we have nothing to stand right. We can't afford to distort it. We can't afford to deviate from God's Word. This is what we must stand on and what we must stand for. Serve the church by equipping the saints. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us about that. Putting on the whole armor of God. Instructing the sheep to be defensive, but we also need to instruct them to be offensive. That's right. So we see, first of all, the shepherd's responsibility, his primary role, is to feed people God's Word and preach and teach the Word. Without diluting, without distorting, and without deviating from the truth. Secondly, the personal role of the shepherd, the preacher must, number one, be without reproach. We are an example, not only to the sheep in our congregations, we are an example to the world. Right. Right. Uh, the personal role of the preacher means a character, the kind of character that we, we say we are Christian because we are Christ-like. We become Christ-like in character, in thought, in what we do and how we act. The preacher must be a broad reproach in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The preacher must have a good reputation in verse 7, the first part of verse 7 in chapter 3. We must live godly before the world, 1 Peter 2.12. The preacher must have the essentials of ministry. What are those essentials? First of all, we must have the essentials of prayer. We have to get right and get alone with God. I believe in the very morning that we raise up. Amen. One thing pastor, my pastor always taught us, to begin your day with prayer and the Word of God. Because Amen. as Pastor Lewis said, we are fighting a battle and you don't know what Satan is going to have for you that day. But by starting with communication with God, by preparing our day by the Word of God, we will be able to fight the wiles of the devil. But we, uh, we must be above reproach, have a good reputation, and live godly before the world. And the preacher must have the essentials of ministry. Number 
number one, the essentials of prayer. Communication with God. It's vital for our ministries. Amen. Very vital. Prayer is more than asking God for something. It is also acknowledging our need for and dependence upon Him. Right. Uh, Acts 6, 4 says, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So we must have the essentials of prayer. Secondly, we must have the essentials of power. There's a lot of churches today that's lost the power of God on their churches. Right. A lot of preachers have lost the power of God on their lives. And we as preachers have no power to convict. We know that. That's the Holy Spirit's work. Amen. Uh, we can't change others, but the Holy Spirit can. Amen. We need to put the power that we have in context and realize that we are nothing in ourselves. Amen. But the power comes from God. And the Holy Spirit that indwells us as believers. Mm -hmm. We must proclaim uh, the essential of the power. We must proclaim Christ not in our power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. I learned this a lot many years ago when I was in the jail ministry. I would uh, go witness. I put him in on a Friday to go see him on Monday. <laughs> uh, had a captive audience. <laughs> But one day I was there and there was no decisions made. Nobody seemed interested. And I got a little discouraged. You pastors probably never get that. <laughs> but I thought, God, nobody got saved. Nobody's interested. And God began to work in my heart. Mm -hmm. And He spoke to my heart and He said, It's not your job. Amen. Yeah, that's right. It's not your job to save people. Your job is to tell. Amen. Your job is to broadcast the truth and allow my Holy Spirit to do the work. Amen. We must purpose also to rest in God's power to present, present the message. We don't, we don't present the message in our power. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need the essentials of prayer. We need the essentials of power. And thirdly, we need the essentials of passion. Brother Lewis, uh, talked about this last night. Brother Trent, I think, talked about this. We must have a passion and compassion for others. The essential of passion, number one, is enthous enthusiasm. Meaning we have a fervor, we have a zeal, we have excitement for God and for His Word. Is that always present? Oh, absolutely not. We do get discouraged. We do get frustrated. When we see a, a member of our church that's not living for God, a member that was faithful for years, and now don't, don't darken the door, we get disturbed. Yeah. But we must have an enthusiasm and fervor for the Word of God. Amen. And by having that, it gives us the zeal to win others by the passion and compassion that we should have. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor setteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. That's why we memorize Scripture. Amen. That's why we continually read the Word of God. Give us that enthusiasm. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalms 119. So Romans 115, the first part says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel. Well, we're ready when we have that enthusiasm, when we have that fervor about the Word of God. Amen. So we need an enthusiasm, but secondly, we need an expectation. Mm -hmm. Confident, trusting in God to produce the fruit. Amen. God's time for the fruit isn't our timing sometimes. That's right. Amen. That's why it's dangerous to prepare a ministry. Right. That's right. Yeah. So, Brother Fitzsimmons in Haiti lives about, uh, well, now about three or four hours, about 90 miles. And uh, he's got a tremendous school, tremendous work, uh, usually has about 500 students in his Bible school, and our Bible school has six. <laughs> but we can't compare ministries because God may use more. That's right. That's right. That's right. And that's all it takes to change a country, you know, to change a world. It can only take maybe just one. Maybe a youth, maybe a child in your youth ministry 
that God's going to raise up and use that one. Do we, know? we don't know. But we need an expectation. We need confidence to trust God to produce the fruit that's necessary for His will, not ours. The people here, God speaks through us. So we have to have our hearts right. We have to be prepared. We have to have enthusiasm. But we have to have expectations. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when He received the Word of God, which He heard of us, He received it not as the Word of men, right. but as it is in truth the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Amen. The people will respond and change if we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work. Amen. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Ica. The people will be saved if we just do what the Lord wants us to do. Right. The people will uh, be instructed and encouraged by the Word of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. It's that power. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 15, 4 says, And whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So, the personal role of the shepherd, uh, we are, uh, the, the preacher, we have to have power, prayer, power, passion, enthusiasm, expectation. And then the third thing we see, the purposeful role of the preacher. Well, our text speaks of loving the sheep. We have to have a love for the sheep. We have to be able to have a protection concerning the sheep. We have to have guidance and leading of the sheep. We have to have provision for the sheep. A presence with the sheep. A personal relationship concerning the sheep. Intimate knowledge of the sheep. Sense of security for the sheep. Sense of belonging, unity, and cooperation with the sheep. So the shepherd's responsibility. The second, the sheep's qualities. The sheep's qualities. Sheep have weaknesses <coughs> and infirmities. Uh, sheep have weaknesses and infirmities. Number one, they're defective in vision. Uh, it's estimated that the maximum limit of a sheep's effective side is no more than 15 yards. 15 yards. And the inability to recognize enemies except at close range makes it an easy prey for predators. And so when it speed, uh, seeks to escape by fleeing, its bottom it can plunge off a cliff. It can go in the wrong direction. It can go into danger because it can only see about 15 yards. And many of the congregations today that we, we lead can't see past the end of their own nose spiritually. And we have to realize that. Uh, a lack of spiritual insight renders too many Christians victims of Satan and false doctrine Paul calls wolves. This is a picture of the ecclesiastical flocks. Sheep are, that aren't fed are hungry. Uh, Sheep have defective vision, but secondly, if they're not fed, they're going to be hungry. Uh, a man by the name of Philip Keller spent a number of years as a professional shepherd and discovered another similarity between four-legged sheep and two-legged sheep. <laughs> sheep that are ill-fed is always on the move and, move and never content. If they're not fed properly, they're not going to be content. Secondly, sheep that are ill-fed they don't thrive. They don't grow. They don't mature. Thirdly, sheep that are ill-fed are of no use to themselves nor of their owners. And lastly, sheep that are ill-fed languish and lack vigor and vitality. He understood that. He was a shepherd. He understood how that relates spiritually to the flock that we lead. And this is uh, exactly how those are in our churches that preach false doctrine. They don't have the truth. They don't get matured. They don't understand. And, or those who refuse to apply the truth of doctrine in their own lives. They're lost. Spiritually. Searching. 
So sheep are hungry, but sheep are also timid. They refuse to lie down unless they are free from fear. Uh, to be at rest, there must be a definite sense of freedom from fear, freedom from tension, and freedom from aggravation. It's, it is only the shepherd himself who can provide release from these different anxieties. Uh, we know in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 17, uh, we have a little bit of responsibility. Now, we are not spies. We are not, as pastors, you don't have a desire to uh, look out the window of your, uh, try, to, try to spy on your congregation, but you do have a responsibility. And Hebrews chapter 13, we see uh, in verse 7, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. You see, that's responsibility of the sheep. Not only do the shepherd have responsibility, the sheep and the congregation have responsibility. And so, uh, verse 17 of that same chapter, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. That is the goal of a pastor. To love, to feed, to watch for the souls of their congregation. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, well, that is unprofitable for you. And lastly, the third thing, we see the Savior's sacrifice. The shepherd's responsibility, the sheep's qualities, and thirdly, the shepherd's sacrifice. Jesus is the good shepherd. Amen. Uh, we see that in verses 11, 15, and 17 of our text. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Number one is a ransom. Amen. Uh, his death was the ransom price paid for our deliverance. Matthew 20, 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of the church. So, uh, the Savior's sacrifice was a ransom, but it was also a propitiation, the appeasement to the mom. Uh, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. 1 John 2, 2. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 4, 10. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. Thirdly, as a reconciliation. To resolve animosity between two people is what that means. Mm -hmm. Between man and God. Jesus Christ is the bridge that brings us back into the right fellowship. Praise right. the Lord. Praise God. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, so much being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Also as a substitute, who His own self bear our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. Amen. First Peter three eighteen. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, yes. the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. There's obviously a great responsibility given to us as believers, but also especially as preachers, missionaries, and pastors who are trying to feed the flock of God. God has given us. Yes. And we have hope for every individual that, that's lost, they can have a shepherd. They can have the true shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. But we as pastors, preachers, have responsibility to feed the flock. We know and can lead others to the good shepherd. Jesus is the answer to all the problems of the world. We try to tell people that door to door. We try to share that. Sometimes they don't accept that truth. But there's some that will. Amen. That's right. There's some that will. We need to concentrate on them, the sun, because we do get screwed. Uh, we live in a culture today, we are living in a culture where the young people have no idea who God is. Right. So you almost have to begin in the Old Testament nowadays because the, the parents obviously didn't teach the children right. So we are in a culture today, we have to begin from the beginning. Yeah. We have to begin to tell them through the Old Testament how God began. Jesus loves us and leads us. He owns us and orders our steps. He redeems us and restores us. And He delights in us and delivers us. And I'll finish with this little poem. It was a sheep, not a lamb. 
It was a sheep, not a lamb, that went astray in the parable that Jesus told. It was a grown-up sheep that wandered away from the ninety and nine in the fold. And out of the hill tops and out of the cold, it was a sheep that the good shepherd saw. And back to the flock and back to the fold, it was the sheep that the good shepherd brought. Now, why should the sheep be so carefully fed and cared for even today? Because there is a danger if they go wrong, they will lead the lambs astray. Right. Mm -hmm. For the lambs will follow the sheep, you know, wherever they wander, wherever they stray. If the sheep go wrong, it will not be long until the lambs are the wrong as they. So till the, till, still with the sheep, we must earnestly plead for the sake of the lambs today. If the lambs are lost, what a terrible cost some sheep will have to pay. And we, as believers, have a responsibility to share the truth with others. Bless our word first. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you for connecting me. And what a privilege it is to preach. He called yesterday afternoon. And uh, obviously we had some changes of plans, so it's a privilege to preach. Take your Bible and turn to a small little book nestled in the back of your New Testament, the book of Jude. Would you turn there, please, to the book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Pastor Green and I are friends. As you can tell, I'm not from Indiana. I pastored in North Carolina for 12 years. We own staff at a church there, and eight years ago, my wife and I and our two children moved to Tipton, Indiana, where the pastor that was there for 40 years retired. And I became the senior pastor, and so we've been here now going on nine years. And one of the things that happened is I became a chaplain uh, for the Tipton County Sheriff's Department and the Police Department. And I got all my training, most of my training, from Brother Green. And I'm grateful for that and for his uh, help in that area. Last Tuesday night, we were in the Kokomo, uh, or the Howard County Correction, uh, the jail, as we would call it. And uh, he preached, and I gave my testimony, and we saw three men saved last Amen. Tuesday night. Amen. And so what a blessing. Last night, I was able to ride... Uh, in one of the with one of the deputies at Tipton, I took some time off yesterday and last night for about five hours. I rode with a new deputy in Tipton County. He and his wife have been visiting our church, and I was able to talk to him. He has been saved, and he said, and as we were driving in the back roads of Tipton County last night, he said, "Preacher, I'm going to join your church, and I want you to baptize me, and my wife and I are going to join your church." Amen. 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 <laughs> then we pulled over somebody that was speaking. I said, Amen. <laughs> so, uh, the Lord's opened up opportunities. I want you to pray for Tipton. Uh, some of you know where we're located, just about 20, 25 miles south of here. We have a huge Chrysler plant coming in to our area. It is the largest economic development in the state of Indiana right now. And we're, we're looking in the next year, year and a half to have 850 new jobs in Tipton. Amen. And so we're excited about that. Amen. And uh, we are also in the process of building a new law enforcement center and uh, a $10 million facility for our county. And we have been working with that and helping. And Brother Green has helped a little bit last Tuesday night as well. So God's opening up opportunities. But yet in Tipton, there's a church. Amen? Amen. It's a Bible-believing church that we are privileged to be a part of and privileged to pastor. And so we're grateful for that. In the back of your New Testament is a little small book uh, called Jude. If I was a betting man, and I'm not, but I would guess you've heard very few messages from this book. It's one of the smallest books in the New Testament. It only has 25 verses, but it is packed full of wisdom and Amen. great Amen. truth for us today. Jude penned this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. His name was really Judas. You may not realize that, but he addresses himself as Judas. And as you, as you look at this book, you wonder, well, why isn't it named Judas? Well, short, Jude is a nickname or a shortened for, for, uh, name for the word Judas. 
Perhaps they put Jude at the title of this book because there was another man in the New Testament that we all know of named Judas Iscariot. And my guess is that perhaps when this was penned some 50, 60 years after the life of Christ, if your name was Judas, you weren't really that popular. Uh, that was not a good name to have uh, after the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus. But nonetheless, Judas or Jude, a servant of Christ, penned this book with God's help. And so I want us to look today at a few thoughts from this book as we look through the book of Jude. And I'm going to begin by reading in the very first verse. He identifies himself and he says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy be unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith Amen. which was once delivered, uh, faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men, verse 4, crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. As we begin to look through this verse or this book, we're reminded of what God has done in our life. And I like verse number one, the very first book, the very first verse that he pins, he reminds us that we are sanctified. He says, I am a servant of Christ, the brother of James. This man that penned this book was the half-brother of Jesus. Right. Amen. And it's interesting, he never mentions that yeah, yeah. when he begins this book. Oh, yeah. You say, why? His emphasis was not on who he was. Right. Amen. His emphasis was on the function that God had called him to do. Right. Amen. And if you look at verse number 1, it's very obvious. He makes it very clear that he was a servant of Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Now you just think with me, if you would, quickly. I don't know about you, but if I grew up in Jesus' home and I was his half-brother the son of Joseph and Mary, I think I'd want a lot of people to know that. <laughs> hey, look at me. I grew up with Jesus. I knew what Jesus was like. He didn't do anything wrong. And really, he did maybe. But I mean, I, I played Tonka toys with Jesus. I say that respectfully. I, I ate with him, and, and we shared a bedroom together, and we did everything together. We played but he never mentioned any of that. Right. He said, I'm a servant right. of Christ. And may I remind all of us here today, preacher, the greatest thing I believe we can be is servants for Christ. Yeah. 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 Good. And he mentions this. He says, I'm the servant of Christ, the brother of James. And then he writes to the early church, he says, to those that are sanctified. I'm glad we're sanctified today. When we get saved, He sets us apart. Christ sets us apart for Amen. Him. Amen. We're sanctified. Then He also says we're preserved in Jesus Christ. Amen. Not only are we sanctified, we're secure in Christ. Those of us and all of us here were of like faith. We believe in the eternal security of the believer. Amen. And I'm thankful for that rich doctrine all through Scripture. Uh, we believe in eternal salvation. Uh, we believe, I use this phrase, in, the, in this neck of the woods, and Brother Han, you know this, and there's not there's a lot of churches in this neck of the woods that doesn't believe this, but we believe once saved, always saved. Amen. And we believe that, and Jude just points that out so wonderfully, preserved in Christ Jesus, Amen. in Jesus Christ, and called. We're sanctified, we're secure, and we're selected. Praise now watch Lord. this. We're never selected. God doesn't select certain people for salvation. But He does select and call people to certain areas of life and ministry. Yeah. When I was 16 years old, I was called to preach. Yeah. We have some missionaries here that were called. You've been called to go to the mission field. 
And I like what he uses. I like this word called here. It carries the idea of being selected. All of us, God has selected for a specific purpose to follow and to serve Him. Amen. Now, God is not willing that any should perish, Amen. but that all should come to repentance. Amen. And so, but when we get saved, and God wants everyone to be saved, Amen. when we get saved, then He calls us to a specific purpose. Amen. Every one of us. And we have the privilege, many of us here have the privilege of pastoring or serving in full-time Christian service. In our pews, in our churches, preacher, many of your congregation will never preach. They'll never pastor. But that doesn't mean God cannot call them to do something. Amen. And we need to pray for laborers. Amen. For years, this is our 20th year in ministry. And for years, brother, I started when I was 22 years old uh, on staff at a church in North Carolina. And for the last 20 years, I have prayed that God would give laborers. Amen. And we need to pray that in our churches. Right. Amen. Amen. And so we see this introduction here he reminds us that we have been sanctified we're secure and we're selected god has called us to a specific purpose and he comes to these people and he pins this to the early church he says in verse three he uses a word that he uses twice in this epistle he uses the word beloved the first word in verse three so he comes to them with a sense of compassion and we're going to see in a moment one of the key verses in this epistle but I'm reminded today that when we come to people, we must come to them with compassion in our hearts. Amen. And so he wrote this epistle, Jude wrote this epistle, penned it rather, because there were false teaching coming into the church. If you've studied this epistle, you will understand the theme of this book. This little small book in the back of our New Testament was, was a book that was written to warn us Amen. of Amen. false teaching. And he begins to give them that idea in verse number 4. He doesn't name names, although we would probably have a tendency to name the name. Right. But I like what he says. He says, there have been certain men that have crept in unaware that are already condemned. They are ordained to this condemnation. They are ungodly men, verse 4, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, in the time that we have remaining, I'm going to give you three thoughts today. Number one, the characteristic of these <laughs> false teachers. Number two, the conduct from these false teachers. And then number three, I'm going to give us some conclusions to help all of us here today. So we see that the characteristics of these false teachers again in verse number four. We see that they were cunning. They were certain men that crept in unaware. They came in, as we would say, through the back door. Yeah. How could these people come into this church and stir up false teaching? Listen, we know from looking at our world today, it's not that hard. Right. That's true. And I appreciate what the first brother said here, our missionary to Korea here. I appreciated what he said in his message. Brother, you stole some of my thoughts. <laughs> but we must, and we will see in a moment, we must earnestly contend for our faith. Amen. And we're living in a world today, as I was talking with some pastor friends this morning as we were driving up from Tipton, we're living in a world today where things are changing. Right, right. right. Tremendously. Yeah. Our church this year, Brother Green, will celebrate its 115th year Amen. in Tipton. Amen. And all these years, believe it or not, we've been an independent Baptist church. Amen. And I told our people this past Sunday as we get prepared to celebrate our 115th anniversary this fall, that I hope uh, for another 115 years, if the Lord tarries, that the message that is being preached today at First Baptist Church will be preached 115 years from now, if the Lord tarries. Amen. 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 And you ought to pray that for your church as well. Amen. Amen. And we must earnestly contend for the faith. They were cunning. They came in. They crept in unaware. Number two, they were condemned by God already, as I have mentioned. And Jude mentions it here as he pins this verse. He said they were ordained to this condemnation. They've not been saved. Right. 
right. Amen. They are condemned by God. Then number three, they were doing wrong. Look again at verse number four. They were ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Don't we see that today? Amen. Yes. Yeah, we see it all around us. They were cunning, they were condemned, they were doing wrong. And then the verse tells us lastly, number four, they were denying the only true and living God. Again, our verse says, deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when we look at verse number four, I'm going to make a comment or two and I'll move on quickly. When we look at verse number four, a lot of times we look at this verse and we can equate it to cults in our society today. There'd be no debate in this crowd that we would all agree that Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. Amen. We would agree that Mormonism is a cult Amen. in America. Amen. We would agree that Islam is a dangerous religion, and I would say this without apology, it is a cult yes. in our world today. Amen. They know not the God we serve. Right. Right. Their God is not the same God we Amen. serve. Amen. Amen. But I'm thinking of where I live. Brother Han, I'm thinking where you pastor. <coughs> Brother Green and others around here in central Indiana, we have a lot of false teaching right outside our back door. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And without naming any names, I want to remind us today that there are churches around us that claim to be Christian, but they preach another gospel. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. In our neck of the woods, for those of you that aren't from here, Baptismal regeneration is a big heresy that's being taught in many of our churches. Right. Yeah. That's right. That baptism is a requirement for salvation. Right. And we know as Bible-believing Christians, as Baptist men and women here, that baptism is never part of our salvation. Right. It's yeah. an act of obedience to our salvation. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. an identification with Christ. Yeah. Amen. But that is a false teaching that we deal with today. We live in our world, in our, in our town of Tipton. Uh, several years ago, we had a very predominant family in our church. They were very faithful. In fact, he grew up in our church. In fact, Brother Green, he even went off to Bible college for a couple of years. He came back and married a girl that got active in our church. He sang in the choir. They were very active. And today, they're in the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In our city. They were pulled away by that group. Yeah. That group that believes in restoration theology and baptismal regeneration. And, and you have to be baptized in our church in order for you to go to heaven. And we are the true church. Yeah. Mm. They believe and they propagate that false gospel. That's right. right. That's right. And so we're battling these things and we see them. We say, well, we see the Mormons once a year knock on our door, or the Jehovah's Witnesses. Listen, every day, preacher, we have to battle false teaching. Amen. 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 In Tipton, we have a Christian church that's with the disciples of Christ. It's a predominant church in our town of 6,000 people. This summer, the disciples of Christ held their annual convention and they voted to allow homosexuals to pastor their churches. In our town of Tipton, I say this without apology, and this crowd can accept it, but that church in Tipton is where all the homosexuals go. No wonder. If they allow the preachers to live that lifestyle and ordain it, then certainly that's where they would go, that lifestyle of people. So we battle with these things all around us, these false teachings. We don't have to go to Utah and look at a cult all around us. It's right in our backyard, some of this false teaching. We need to be aware of it. So number one, we see these characteristics. Number two, I want us to see the conduct resulting from these false teachings. And Jude does such a wonderful job. He does a whole lot better job than I can do. He gives three stories. Now, I'm not a very good storyteller. Perhaps you are. But if I tell a story from behind my pulpit, Brother Green, I have to literally write it all out and almost read it. Or I will stumble through it. <laughs> But Jude here does a wonderful uh, 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 storytelling object lesson in verse 5, 6, and 7 under, of course, the inspiration of God and the Holy Spirit. 
as he was penning these words, he gives three stories. And I want us to focus on these quickly. Look at verse 5. He says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. He said, now remember. Remember. He says, remember, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. So number one, he tells them and reminds them of the children of God that came out of Egypt. Right, yeah. Number two, it gets worse. He says, and remember the angels, verse 6, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So then he takes them back to Genesis, I believe, chapter 6, and he says, remember the fallen angels? And how they, and there's a lot of different interpretations. And we've got uh, several professors here from IBC, so I have to be careful because they may look at it a little different than I. And it's not an easy uh, story to, to pan out in our minds. But from what I understand, God created these angels and they fell and they, and they, they came down to earth and they inhabited with human beings. They left the very nature of God that, they cre that God created them in. Mm -hmm. But then it gets worse. Look at verse 8, 7. He reminds them again of Sodom and Gomorrah that's been mentioned already today. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He used a strong language there. Mm -hmm. We see the conduct resulting when false teaching came in the church. Examples of what happened in Egypt and in the wilderness and examples of what happened at the early age of our earth and examples of Sodom and Gomorrah will begin to take place in our world today and in our churches. Let me give you three quick thoughts about each one of these. When we look at Egypt in verse number 5, they're, they were guilty of unbelief. If you look again in verse number 5, God destroyed them that believed not. There were many that left Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. We know the story. And they wandered. You say, preacher, why did they wander for 40 years? They wandered because they had unbelief in their heart. Right. Right. Yeah. Amen. It's true. Now I'm going to be honest with you today. Probably one of the biggest things I struggle with as a preacher is unbelief. Yeah. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, yes, I put my faith and trust in Christ. I know that if I die today, I've been saved. I got saved at, at 10 years of age. I got saved off the bus ministry. Amen. I wasn't saved in a Christian home. My mom and dad never shared the gospel with me. But one day somebody came and knocked on my door and I went to a church and I got saved. Amen. Amen. And so I know I've been saved. I've been redeemed. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. God has called me to preach. I understand all that. But I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes I wonder, God, can you really do it in Tipton, Indiana? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My guess is here there are some preachers and missionaries, perhaps you felt that same way. Brother, from Haiti, I appreciate your message. I'm good friends with the Fitzsimmons. Our church has supported them for 20 years. They're dear, precious people. And I appreciated the comments. He said we cannot compare our ministries. But I guarantee you, if Brother Rodney and his wife, Miss Kathy, were here, they would have to say that there's been times they wondered whether God would see them through. Yeah. We've all been there. Let's be honest. Listen, unbelief is, is something that we all struggle with in our life. The children of Israel struggle with it in the wilderness. We struggle with it on this side of the cross. We wonder, God, can you really see us through? God, can you really save that person that I've witnessed to time and time and time again? We must not give up, and I'll show you that in a moment. Unbelief. Number two, as we look at verse number six, the angels... There's a key word in verse number 6. Probably the key word in that verse is the little word left there. And the angels which kept not their first estate, they left their own habitation. The word left there comes from a Greek word that literally means they intentionally left something behind. They willfully left what God had designed for their life. 
And the second story that we see in verse number 6 reminds us that these angels were without doubt disobedient to God. The children of Israel, they, they, their sin was unbelief. These angels, their sin was disobedience. They intentionally left the very nature that God had created them to be and they co-inhabited with human beings on this earth that was totally against what God had designed them to be. Mm -hmm. They were disobedient. And then we come to a very familiar story, verse number 7. He reminds them of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't need to be reminded of that story. I had a preacher call me not too long ago, a, a fundamental Baptist preacher in this state that pastors a wonderful independent Baptist church, and he said, Preacher, I believe the dividing line that is going to face our churches today in America is the line on this issue of homosexuality. That's right. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, There's a lot of truth to that. I said, well, I never thought of that before. But we're going to take our stand, and most of us here know what stand to take, and we've right. already made that stand. Amen. But I'd hate to see the day, but it may come when, Brother James, you'll have to come see me in jail. Right. Or I'll have to come see you in jail for preaching the Word. We don't wish that upon any of us, but there may come a day. And so as we look at verse number 7 and we come to the conclusions, we see that uh, they, had the, they were guilty of the sin of immorality. Or you can even use a stronger word there. They were guilty of the sin of perversion. Now follow the trend. Verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 7. Now stay with me for just a second. In verse 5, you see the sin of unbelief. In verse 6, you'll see the sin of disobedience. In verse 7, you see the sin of immorality or perversion. And listen, when false teaching comes into our churches and when false teaching pervades our land, you'll see people that have no belief in God. They'll fall into a life of disobedience and their life will be nothing but a life of immorality. And friends, that's what we're seeing in our culture today. May God help us. May God help us. We see it on the mission field. We see it in our backyard. We see it down the street. We see it in Washington, D.C. We see it all over the world. You show me a person that has no belief in God, I'll show you a person that is disobedient to anything that's in this book that has right. no moorings or no anchor for their soul, and I'll show you a person that will live their life in immorality. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In one form or fashion or another. Yeah. And so do you see the trend here in verse 5 and 6 and 7? The conduct. It's not easy. It's not uh, a pretty picture. But he gives some hope. Now he uses some other stories in verses 8 through um, 18. I won't get into all that. He uses some other stories too. And he uses other stories from Old Testament. He's reminding the early church here. And he does it with love. He says beloved in verse 3. And he, he uses this word beloved in verse 20 again. And he comes to them gently. He reminds them of the state and the depravity of these people all around them. And the whole all around him. He reminds him of that. But then he gives hope. Yeah. And that hope begins to end this epistle. And we find some concluding thoughts. We won't share them all. But we find some concluding thoughts in verse number 20. And I'll draw your attention to that verse if you would. He uses the word, or he uses verse 17. He uses this word beloved again. Verse number 17. He says, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles. How that they told you, verse 18, there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves. They're sensual, having not the Spirit, capital S. Again, he goes back to the very truth that they've never been saved in the first place. We know this. You're either saved or lost. Right now. And I'm convinced that a lot of the false teaching today certainly does not come from the spirit that lives inside of our heart. Amen. So he reminds them. Amen. Verse 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Verse 22, we know this verse, we can quote it, and if some having compassion, making a difference. 
Verse 23, and others safe with fear pulling them out of the fire. Let me give you a couple concluding remarks here as we draw this epistle to a close. Number one, yes, we have unbelief. Yes, we have disobedience. Yes, we have immorality. Yes, we have false teaching, preacher. But what is the answer? Well, the answer is found right here very clearly. He says in verse number 17, number one, we're to remember the Scripture. Amen. 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 Yeah. Good preaching. But beloved, and again, he comes to them as an, with a term of endearment. The word beloved there is a beautiful word. He comes to them with a term of endearment, and he gently says to them, Church, saints, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles. Today, we can remember the word. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I appreciate what the message has said earlier. And we need to, we're all, these fellowship meetings, there's not a fellowship meeting that I don't go to, Brother Green, when someone doesn't just remind us to get back to the old book. Amen. 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 We don't need a new book, we just need to follow the old book. Amen. Amen. And he says, remember! Remember! So our mooring and our anchor and our standard is the precious Word of God. Amen. The inspired and errant preserved Word of God for us. Amen. He says, remember the Word of God. Remember, and he uses, he even gets even more specific. He says, which the apostles, our Lord Jesus Christ, have spoke. So he goes back to validity. He goes back to someone that has credibility. He goes back to the apostles. And boy, if you were an early church Christian in this time, you dare not mess with the apostles. Because they were God's men. So number one, he says, remember the word, and we should too. Number two, he says, recall the times that we're in. We remember and we recall. We don't have to touch long on this verse, verse 18. He says, they told you that in the last times there would be mockers and those that would walk after their own ungodly lust. And boy, don't we live in that time today? Yeah. I've made this statement before in counseling and talking to other pastors, Brother Green. I've made this statement many times. Well, I thought I saw it all until now. <laughs> Perhaps you've made that statement as well. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I saw it all until now. Now I'm dealing with a whole other issue. I remember last year, a sweet girl in our church, and God's given her the victory. And, and in fact, she went off to Bible college. But she came to us several years ago, and her mom and dad came into my office. My wife was with me. Her mom and dad was with me. She <laughs> said, well, what's wrong? Here's a teenager in our youth group. And she says, I'm cutting myself. Will you help me, preacher? Demonic activity. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 20 years ago, when I first started in ministry, I dealt with rebellious teenagers. Still deal with them today. Yeah. Well, our youth pastor deals with them. Thank God I don't have to deal with them. <laughs> I say that respectfully. But who would have ever thought that in this era of my life, Brother Bob, I'd be dealing with a young person that was cutting herself. Mm -hmm. But we deal with this, do we not? And all things around us. And we're reminded today from verse number 18, and we're reminded through the Scripture that we're certainly living in perilous times. Amen. Amen. There's no question. Amen. So we remember and we need to recall that. And then number three, I wrote, we need to refocus our life. And we see the focus here in verses 20 and 21 and 22 and 23. And I'll make four comments and I'll close. We see an inward look, verse 20 and 21. What does he say? He says, we're to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Listen, I'm not, mess, not going to preach a message on prayer today, but number one, we ought to be a praying Amen. people. Amen. Amen. We ought to take everything to God in prayer. Amen. And so when we see these times that we live in and we see all the difficulties in life, we take everything to God in prayer. Amen. And so he remember, he brings us inwardly. He says, look inward. You're to have a praying life. And then number two, you're to have a keeping life. And this is good for us that are preachers and us that are missionaries. Verse 21, he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Listen, this word keep means to guard, to carefully take care of, to watch over. Listen, we need to be in love with Jesus Amen. like we were when we were first saved. Amen. Amen. And I know, preacher, I'm speaking to myself here. 
We've been beat down. We've been worn down. We've been criticized. We've been misunderstood. We've stood for God's Word. We've stood for right. And people have misunderstood us. But we're to still keep ourselves in the love of God. Amen. Amen. We're to still keep it. Keep ourselves in the love of God. Do you love Jesus? Amen. Amen. I hope you do. Yeah. I have to check myself and remind myself. Do I love Jesus? Amen. I have two teenage boys at home. They're growing up quick, Brother James. And they hear mom and dad talk about people in the church. If we're not careful, we'll say things we shouldn't say around our boys. I've always prayed to the Lord. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But I always prayed, Lord, I don't want my boys to grow up and hate the church. Amen. And if you're a pastor here, I would hope you would pray the same for your children. Amen. That Daddy went through so much and so much difficulty. And yes, we have trials. And yes, we have nine deacons. And Lord, help us. And, and we have all these things that we have to deal with in our church. I don't want my boys to grow up and resent God. Amen. And so we have to keep ourselves. Now watch this. In the love of God. My first desire, my first focus ought to be to love Him every yes. day. Amen. So there's an inward look. And then lastly, number two, and I close with this, there's an outward look. Verse number 22 and 23, beautiful verses. We've preached, and you've probably heard a message on verse 22. It's a great uh, example, a great message for missionaries and of some having compassion, making a difference. I wrote down caring. We're praying. We're keeping. Number three, we're caring. Compassion. And of some having compassion, making a difference. Last night I spent some time with one of our new deputies on our sheriff's department. He said, Preacher, I'm going to take you out to eat. So we went to a local restaurant. and He said, I'm going to call in four or five other guys from the department. We'll all eat together. I said, that sounds good. So we, we ate together last night. There were about five or six Officers from uh, Howard County, some from Tipton, we all just met and had lunch last, or supper last night together while we were patrolling. And some of those men used some words that I wouldn't use <laughs> around the dinner table. They saw, they knew, I, they knew who I was. I'm the chaplain. <laughs> but you know what? I just didn't say a word. I bit my tongue and I just prayed. God strike them. No, I didn't pray. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, help me to be able to witness to them. But you know, at the end of the conversation, every one of them came up and shook my hand and said, Preacher, thanks for coming and eating dinner with us. Mm -hmm. And some having compassion, Amen. making a difference. Mm -hmm. Some having compassion in Korea. Some having compassion in Mexico. Some having compassion in Haiti. Yeah. Those are not easy fields to go to. But we need some people today that will have compassion. Amen. Making a difference. Yep. And then he says, not only should we be praying, keeping, caring, but number four, we should be calling. Look at verse number 23. A powerful verse. And some saved with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. The word saved there means to deliver or to protect. It carries the idea to heal or to make whole. Now we know this, and let me just remind you quickly, when someone gets saved, they get whole. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And get all of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And we're to save fear, pulling them out of a fire. We don't need to be reminded today of this truth. We all believe this, but there's a literal fire. Yeah. Yeah. There's a hell to shine and a heaven to gain. Amen. Amen. There's a real hell. Where the word and sinners that refuse to trust Christ and they refuse to be saved and they know not the Scripture, they will die and spend eternity in the devil's hell. Yeah. And we need to be reminded today that we're to be saving those, pulling them out of the fire, calling them to repentance, yeah. calling them to Jesus, calling them to come to the cross, Amen. calling out, will you be saved? Constantly calling them out. Amen. Yeah. Out from the world yes. to Christ. Yeah. We must do that. Mm -hmm. And we must do that. And that must be our business. Mm -hmm. 
There's a lot of things we like to do. But the greatest thing, as we've been reminded today by this dear brother from Haiti, we must be fishers of men and we must go out and reach the lost sheep who need a Savior. So we're to pray. We're to keep. There's a praying. There's a keeping. There's a caring. And there's a calling. We must constantly call people. Amen. Whether it's in the jail, Brother Green, it's on a door, knocking on a door in Tipton, Indiana, it's in Muncie, Indiana, wherever your field is, wherever your vineyard is, we must constantly call people Amen. to the Amen. saving knowledge of Christ. Amen. A few weeks ago, I preached a simple message in our church and over to my left here was a man and his girlfriend, and I had known the man but never met the girl or the lady. And I preached just a simple message, and I had everybody bow their head and close their eyes. I said, if you want to be saved today, raise your hand. Like many of you would do. And she raised her hand. Long story short, 30 minutes later, after the service, she was gloriously saved. Amen. Amen. My wife led her to the Lord. Amen. She trusted Christ, 45 Amen. years old. Amen. And she made the comment, here's a lady, she was a professional lady, she's a nurse, works in this area of Brother Green. She has education, she has knowledge, but she made this comment, she said, I have never heard the gospel before. Amen. May we save people Amen. from the fire. Amen. Amen. And some having compassion, making a difference. The world is full of false teaching. Yes. But may we have that compassion, saving them from the fire. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this little epistle, this wonderful book, rich 